Well, if you've got your uh, Bibles with you, you might want to turn to Galatians. It's the book that we're looking at uh, at the moment and towards the end of Galatians chapter 5. And as you're doing that, um, you, you know, as our families expanded over the years, and as our children have grown up and got married, and they themselves have had children, we now have grandchildren. I, I, I've been thinking about some of our our own family memories um, recently, thinking about how um, there was such joy in teaching the children to to ride bikes, for instance, or going to schools and watching school plays or watching sports matches. Um, the the dread of opening. Um, exam results with uh, children, getting to baptise children, which I've managed to do on, on a couple of occasions, or or even walking them down the aisle. Uh, that's Hannah, not the uh, the boys. And, and I sort of love those memories. And, and I want to keep making memories. Um, and I can't wait for, for our family holiday that's coming up um, later on this year. But for me, uh, one of the best memories of all has been skiing with the family, skiing with the children. And, and I know it's not something that everybody gets to do, and, and so there's been an incredible privilege of being able to do that. Um, but there's just this, thi this, this thing about skiing where there's this incredible sense of freedom uh, until you fall and perhaps break something. And, and we haven't been for years, but there is just something about coming down the slopes, and especially if you've got one of your children with you as well. And I, I still imagine the music of uh, Ski Sunday going through my mind, and I used to hum it to myself again and again, but there's just this amazing sense of freedom. And, and I'm not sure whether it's possible to be in a bad mood uh, when you're skiing. And, and I've been thinking about this series that we're in at the moment, this, this movement series, and I was thinking actually about the freedom of skiing as I was thinking about movement. And I, I reckon that if we all went skiing together, it would probably take care of a, a huge number of the world's problems, actually, because there's just so much joy in an activity like that, that there is just this extraordinary sense of feeling free. And freedom is the reason that Paul is writing this letter to the church at Galatia, because, because they're part of the movement of Jesus. And he's basically saying, I want you to be free. Uh, and as we've been working through this letter, through this epistle together, you, you'll know that I've, I've been talking about how there were some folk uh, in Galatia who, who were uh, legalists, these Judaizers, and they'd come into the church with false teaching. And they were basically saying, that if you want to be a follower of Jesus, then what you need to do is to follow the Mosaic law. You know, you need to follow the ceremonial law, you, you, you need to be circumcised, you need to follow the dietary restrictions. And they were telling these Gentile Christians that, 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 that if you wanted to be a follower of Jesus, then you had to do all these extra things on top. And, and Paul is basically writing this letter to the church in Galatia, which is in a region, so it's a group of churches. And he's basically saying, no, 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 no. You can't add to the gospel. You know, the, the, the moment you start adding to the gospel, it's no longer good news. And, and, and that's what legalism does. I've said that a few times now, but it, it adds performance to Jesus in order to be saved. And actually legalism uh, uses guilt and shame as a motivator. Guilt is a, it's a powerful motivator, but perhaps not for long. But, but legalism uses guilt and shame to produce certain behaviours you know, in and out of people and so they were coming in with, with guilt and shame and putting that on people. And, and that's what I want to call a religious spirit. And, and, and that religious spirit of, of legalism sees God as this strict judge who's behind the bench waiting to drop the hammer. And it sort of sees him as a, as a harsh teacher who's looking um, over our shoulder all the time, just waiting and watching for us to do something wrong. And, and Paul is saying, no, 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 that's just not true. There's this. This is freedom. You know, we, we, we have a heavenly father and we have a relationship with him. And, and Paul wants to speak into this legalism so that we would live in this freedom. So he picks a fight with these legalists. And I don't know whether you've ever picked a fight. You, you know, whether you've ever had a moment where you 
saw something going on and you just knew that it wasn't right and you just knew that there was something that you had to do about it. You know, years ago, when um, Karen and I started Married Life Off and we were living in Oxford, <coughs> we, we were both working. Um, but Karen was an occupational therapist, I was in the world of finance, but in the evenings, <coughs> I, I was involved in a mercy ministry um, out on the streets, out of a base that, that we call the catacombs. And, and we were really working amongst the vulnerable adults who had addiction type problems and uh, who, who had just fallen on really hard times basically but i was out on the streets one evening in oxford and and uh, i was walking along the street when i heard the, 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 this woman's voice saying get your hands off me get your hands off me and uh, and um I, I i i looked down the alley and there was this woman who was who'd been pushing a pram and 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 there was this this youngish man um, but not that young, who had his arm round her neck and had her in a sort of uh, a, a headlock. And, and in, in that moment, my adrenaline kicked in and I, I, I ran down the alley and I said, let her go, to which he replied, you need to mind your own business. And, and I, I said in, in reply, and I, I clearly wasn't thinking, I said, well, it's my business now, something like that. And, and, and you know, I, I, it was all I new to say and you know reflection it sounds like a good line out of a Clint Eastwood film but but in that moment I was also thinking you know I think I'm just picking a fight I think I'm just picking a fight and and he stepped out and we sort of squared up and and and, and in those sort of moments you're sort of planning your next couple of moves you know you, you don't know what's really going to happen um, but, but you're actually what's going through your mind is goodness me this is it how did I end up in this situation but in that moment thank god he just took off and ran in the opposite direction. And, and, and I said, you know, are you okay? And I, I took this woman pushing her pram out onto the main street and, and somebody else from the team um, took her off to the catacombs, took her off to our base, you know, there was, they didn't have mobile phones in those sort of days. Can you imagine no mobile phones? And so we, we, we took her to, or they took her to the base where we operated at all, so that she could be looked after and, and get somebody to come and pick her up. But, but, but eventually when I got back, I, I said, how is she, how is she doing? And, and, and one of the teams said, well, her, her cousin came to pick her up. And, and, and I said, well, what did he look like? And they described the very chap that I just squared up to, you know, um, an hour or so earlier and it was just like oh my goodness no 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 and that's what Paul is feeling here because he's actually seen the bride of Christ go back he's seen the bride of Christ go back to legalism you know to going back to being entrapped to being enslaved and in bondage up to the law and so it's like he's going no 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 this can't happen and if we look at the text, you know, this is really what he's saying, you know, don't go back to the rules, don't go back to the regulations. So in Galatians 5, 1, he says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You know, don't go back to bondage, you know, don't go back to legalism, don't go back to the old ways, you know, don't go back to Egypt, you've been set free. And, and basically Paul has it in. For these false teachers, for these characters who are trying to teach the, these new Gentile believers that if you want to be a follower of Jesus and you've got to follow the law, then you've got to be circumcised, follow the Mosaic law. And, and, and look at what Paul says in, in, in verse 12 of chapter 5. He says, as for those agitators, I wish they'd go the whole way and emasculate themselves. It's like, okay, but why don't you really tell us how you feel about this? It, you know, basically what he's saying is, I, I, I wish you wouldn't stop the circumcision. I wish you'd go the whole way and chop everything off, you know. And, and who said the Bible is boring? I mean, it's in the book. And Paul is just mad. He's just infuriated here, you know, because the gospel is at stake, because freedom is at stake. And Paul is really passionate about this. And he's saying, listen, we have to speak in to this. And he's speaking it to us as well for us so that we wouldn't be enslaved to the bondage of the law that we would feel free that we would be able to live in that freedom you know legalism it forfeits the freedom that christ purchased at the cross 
it stalls the movement of Jesus. And Paul is saying, I want you to be free, and God wants us to be free. And actually not just to be free, but to move forward in freedom. And, it, and listen, it's not freedom to do whatever we want, but freedom to do what God wants us to do. What, what he's called us to, what he's empowered us for. And, and the gospel brings about freedom. And in, a, in verse 7 of chapter 5, Galatians 5, 7, Paul says, You are running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? And he's basically saying, you were moving, you're on the way forward, you were doing really well, you know, you were coming down the piste really well, you were running a great race, you know. Who cut in on you? Who knocked you off, you know? you know? Who knocked you off the piste? Who took you out of the race, you know? Who took you out, you know? Who stalled the movement of Jesus in your life, you know? Who, you know, who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? And... and, and when I think about skiing, essentially th th there are two ways to fall off your skis. And, and, and of course, if you're a regular on the slopes, which one or two of you are, then you, you, you'll think of other creative ways of coming off your skis as well. But, but primarily, there are two ways of coming off your skis. Do you know what they are? Either to the left or to the right. You know, and there are two ways, primarily, of losing your freedom in Christ, your sense of freedom in Jesus. And it's to the left or to the right. And one way is legalism and the other is licentiousness. And Luther, Luther said it this way, the reformer said it this way, a drunk person can fall off a horse, get back up and fall off the other way. So, so here's the deal, on the one side you, you've got legalism, you know, what is legalism? Well, legalism is this performance-based spirituality. It's saying, you know, I, you know, I've got to earn God's love. I've got to earn God's acceptance. I've, I've got to earn God's forgiveness. I've got to uh, earn um, this thing of being right with God. And, and, and the danger of legalism is that you, you, you're never at peace. You know, you're always going, I'm not good enough. I'm just not good enough. You know, am I saying the right things? Am I doing the right things? You know, you know, you know if I mess up, am I still good? With with God, you know, you know, you know, will you ever forgive me? Am I good enough to get to to heaven? And and and, and legalism tells us that we're always trying to earn, and, and we get we find ourselves on this treadmill of performance based spirituality, trying to earn God's love that has already been given to us. And 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 what what happens in legalism is there's this enormous list of instructions that we can carry that we can get buried under so we can fall off as it were that way towards a legalism but but there's another way to fall off uh, 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 as it were and that's towards licentiousness and, and another way of saying that is uh, uh, it's it's a license to sin and, and what licentiousness is saying is you know you know I, I know that i've received god i know that i've received god's forgiveness you know i know that i've received his grace you know i, I prayed a prayer to trust in Jesus to get to get me down when I die and so now I can just live however I want to live and do whatever it is I want to do and, and because we've got God's forgiveness we can um, never say we've got a, a loophole in the tax code of, of, of heaven it's like because I've got heaven then I, I can do whatever I want which if we're being really honest and transparent taking it to the, the extreme is the equivalent of St sticking your middle finger up at, at God, actually, you know, it's basically saying, you know, you know what, God, you know, I, I I'm going to live how I want to live. I'm going to live however I want to live here on earth. I, I really don't care what you think. And you see, license to sin says, God, I'm forgiven. I, I can do whatever I want. You know, I, I can live however I want. You know, I, I can raise hell here on earth and spend eternity with you in heaven. But it was Dietrich Bonhoeffer back in. Um, 1937, who called that cheap grace. And, and, and the reality was, is that Paul was addressing this long before that. So, so, so look at what he says in verse 13 of, of chapter 5. He says, uh, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. You, you see, if we give up our freedom for this, we end up being slaves to sin. So, so, so we can be either slaves to the law or we can be slaves to sin. 
But either way, we're slaves, we're entrapped, we're enslaved. But, but Jesus gave his life so that we could be free, so that we could experience freedom. So listen to how Tim Keller talks about it. He says this, Christians typically identify two ways to respond to God. Follow him and do his will, or reject him and do your own thing. Ultimately, this is true, but there are actually two ways to reject God that must be distinguished from one another. You can reject God by rejecting his law and living any way you see fit. And you can also reject God by embracing and obeying God's law so that you earn your salvation. The problem is that people in this last group who reject the gospel in favour of, favour of moralism look as if they are trying to do God's will. Consequently, there are not just two ways to respond to God, but three. Irreligion, religion and the gospel. Isn't that interesting? It's really good. So, so what is the gospel? Well, the gospel is, the heart of the gospel is the reality that Jesus gave his life on the cross for us, that he was raised from the dead on that first Easter Sunday so that we could be made right with God so that we could be secure in Christ, so that we could be filled with his presence, so that we could be filled with his spirit, and that his spirit fills us, you know, so that we don't have to have insecurity, so that we can be right with God, and so that we can live in freedom. And the truth is that there is freedom. And this is the overarching, this is the meta-narrative of the New Testament, that there is freedom in Christ. And Jesus said it in this way in John, John 8, you know, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And the truth of that verse is that there is truth that we can know. And that truth leads to freedom, that there is a freedom that we can experience. There's a freedom that we can have. So, so how can we have that freedom? Well, you know the truth. And what is the truth? Well, let me give you the truth. This is the truth of the freedom that we have in Christ, yeah, and we need to know the truth. You know, but Paul in Colossians 1 tells us that we've been set free from the dominion of darkness. In Romans 6, Paul says that we've been set free from the power of sin. In Romans 7, he tells us that we're free from the burden of the law. Romans 8 again, that we're free from the power of death. Luke 4, um, and it tells us that we're free from captivity and oppression. Hebrews 2 tells us that we're free from the fear of death. Listen, if we are in Christ, we don't have to be afraid to die. And, and in reality, I think, and I know I've spoken into this quite a lot, you know, over the last two years, that, that, that there has been such a fear of death and it's sort of increasingly covering the earth right now. But if we are in Christ, we don't have to be afraid of dying. Why? Because Jesus conquered death. It doesn't mean that we want to die it's just that we don't have to be afraid of it it's like jesus took the teeth out of the dragon of fear so that we don't have to be afraid of death and actually there is so much freedom in that i don't know whether you know <clears throat> but i was reading this a little while ago um when they were building the uh, golden gate bridge in um san francisco uh, when they uh, started building it that, that they had a real problem with the building of the first section and it's this that the people that were building it started falling and, and as they fell of course there was such a long way to fall that they they died and apparently 23 men fell to their death as they built that first section and, and then somebody had the idea of putting a net underneath for future building so they put this net underneath and it, i mean it cost about one hundred thirty thousand dollars when they did it which in those days was a huge sum of money but 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 that they found that, that with the net there, uh, that there were 19 men that fell and they were all saved. So, so that was the second phase of construction, that the net was there. But they also found, this what was really interesting, is that the workers worked 27% faster. And do you know why? Because they weren't afraid. They weren't afraid. You see, when we receive the courage and the strength and the and the power when we receive the hope of the gospel we can know that sort of 
freedom. We don't have to be paralyzed by fear. And the enemy wants to wants us to be paralyzed by the fear of death. But but in Christ, what we get to know is that we will live forever. In fact, the biggest problem for those guys working on the Golden Gate Bridge was, you know, was that they were letting go on purpose and enjoying hitting the net. You know, they, they were using it as a trampoline, bouncing back up again. Some of them were using it as a hammock for a rest because they weren't afraid anymore. And I just wonder how much joy God wants to return to our hearts today. As he says, you, you don't need to fear death. You don't have to be afraid. And, 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 and if, we're, if we're being honest, um, it's possible that there's something that, that, that a lot of people fear even more than death, and that's rejection. And the Bible calls that the fear of man. So in Proverbs 29, verse 25, it says it this way, The fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. I love that. That is so good. It's that trusting in the Lord. It's that trusting in him. That's where we're safe. It's that trusting in him that, where we find security. And it says the fear of man is, is a trap. So listen to how Paul describes that in, in Galatians 1 verse 10. Um, am I now trying to win the approval of human, human beings or of God? Am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And basically what he's saying is that the gospel sets us free uh, from people pleasing. And, and that is good news. It sets us free from trying to earn other people's approval. You know, we're, we're not in bondage to what will they think if I do this or what will they think if I, if I do that, you know. Uh, but because it's so easy to go through life looking for the, the praise of others and the gospel sets us free in it fills our insecurity because we ultimately find our security and our rest and our refuge in Christ. I, 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 was, I was really interested to read again in um, uh, uh, Sunday Times magazine actually, um, 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 apparent about Oprah Winfrey and, and apparently the number one question people ask her after every interview is, how did I do? Uh, uh, apparently from royals to rock stars to politicians to movie stars to sports icons to presidents even you know it's like how did I do and, and, and the truth is that inside all of us that there is that temptation to ask how did I do you know and in ministry in terms of what I do it's perhaps one of the greatest challenges over the years I've hung around lots of other ministers and speakers and preachers and you know that temptation to ask how did I do I mean years and years ago many many years ago now I, I, I was a, at a conference as, as a, a young Christian and uh, as I was coming out of one of the sessions I, I heard um, um, people talking about the speaker and saying what an amazing speaker he was and then a bit later in the day I was in another session and I as I came out I, I, I heard uh, people around me talking about uh, God and, and in that moment, I, I really had that sense the Lord was whispering to me, Mark, who do you want them to talk about? Do you want them to talk about you? Or do you want to talk, them to talk about me? And whilst I know at times people have spoken about me, um, sometimes positively and negatively, uh, in the end, what I really want people to do is to talk about him, to talk about the Lord. You see, I, I didn't get into this to please other people. I, I got into this and I returned to this to, to try and please the Lord and live before him. And I think that's what saves us from people pleasing, actually. Whatever your profession, whatever it is that you do, you know, whatever it is that God calls us to, you need to be able to say, you know, we're not in this to please others, others. we're in this to please Jesus. And, and what Paul is saying is that's where the freedom is. There is freedom in this. You know, you know there needs to be a freedom from what other people think. Now, I, I, again, I read another article recently uh, about scooters, e-scooters. You know those e-scooters, you can't go into town, you can't go into any city around the world now and not see these sort of uh, you know, e-scooters everywhere. And, and, and I've never been on one, but I'm truly tempted to have a gone one. Anyone else tempted to have a gone one? You know, I, they're inside of me, I really want to have a gone one, you know, because when I see people whizzing through the streets, getting around quickly, I see, I see them traveling with so much freedom. 
And apparently lots of people, this is what the article said, lots of people want to try them, but they don't want to try them in their own towns. They don't want to try them in their own cities. Why? Because they're worried about what other people might think. So you can ride them if you're a tourist. You can ride them if you're a visitor in another city because there you don't care what other people think. And, you know, it just frees you up in life, frees us up in life when our audience shrinks down to one. And the people of Jesus, you know, for us, the call is to live only and all for him, that we live before an audience of one. You know, you've probably heard it said you can't please people, you can't please all the people all the time, and you might be able to please some of the people some of the time. But, but, but I think actually what we're learning in our current culture, in our current cancel culture, if the truth be known, is you can't really please anybody. But we can please God. And we already have his love. And we already have his attention. And that's how we work through, that's how we get through this fear of man. You know, it, it's, it's, it's the fear of God actually in the end. It's this reverence for God saying, Lord, I just want to please you. And Paul is basically saying that's where the freedom comes from. And, and, and then he tries to whittle it all down in, in Galatians 5. And it's really simple. And we're just going to pick it up in verse 14. I just want to read this really quickly. But uh, Paul says this, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So Paul is basically saying, you know, don't fall into legalism. And don't fall into licentiousness, this license to sin. You know, he's basically saying that there is freedom to live this life that, that God has for you in the power of the Spirit. You know, the Spirit of God dwells in you, dwells in us. And, and he's basically saying it's only through the presence of God, it's only through the Spirit of God that we can live lives of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. This is the Jesus life. And we can't do this life on our own. You know, when those um, e-scooters uh, in town uh, run out of battery, they, they just go beep, 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 and then they stop. And that's what it feels like. That's actually what it looks like when we try to do the Christian life in our own power. And actually, I just wish that we could hear the beep, 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 sort of, when we do run out of power. I wish there was a moment when we knew um, when it was that we were trying to do the life of Jesus in our own strength or in our own power. But because God is saying, I don't want you to do it in your own strength. I don't want you to do it in your own power. I want you to trust me. I want you to walk with me. I want you to be empowered by me. Let me come to you. Let me fill you. Let me empower you. And Jesus is the only one who fulfilled totally the Christian life. In fact, he was so good at it that they named the whole thing after him. And he wants to live the life of Christ in us. How? Through the power of his spirit. And he's promised us that kind of power. You know, it's what we're looking forward to next Sunday when John Hughes comes to speak you know, on Pentecost Sunday. Jesus promises followers that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. 
And if you're wondering how much power that is, well, Romans 8, Roman 8, Romans 8 says this, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. There is no other power like that. It's the power over addiction. It's the power to obey. It's the power to stand in the face of persecution. It's the power to go public with your faith. It's the power to have hard conversations. It's the power to walk away. It's the power to say the right thing at the right time in the right way. It's the, the power to confess sin. It's the power if you, you fall and mess up to get back up again. And it's the power to, to love unconditionally and to forgive when you don't feel like forgiving. It's the the power to stare fear in the face and move forward with courage. It's the, the, the power to handle bad news with deep-seated faith and joy. It's the power to say no to your friends and to point your friends to Jesus. The same power that blew the stone off the face of the rock lives in you and it lives in me. And you're asking, how do I get that kind of power? Well, if you're in Christ, if we're in Christ, we have that. We have that kind of power. And we access, access it the same way that we access salvation, actually, by grace, through faith. It begins with believing. You know, God, God, you put your spirit, you put your power in me. And, and, and maybe, maybe you've forgotten that you have that kind of, that kind of power. Maybe you've fallen off into legalism and some sort of performance-based sort of based faith, trying to earn God's love. Maybe you've fallen off into licentiousness and uh, you're just using it as a license to sin. But do you know what you have to do when you fall over? Whether you fall off the skis or you fall off the e-scooter, you get back up and you get back on. And we need to know that even if we've made a mess of everything, we're never more than a prayer away from returning to God and we get back up and we get back on and we keep going. Amen. Let's uh, let's bow our heads in prayer just for this moment and let's be still before we go into the remainder of this week and say Lord Jesus Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the life in your word. Thank you for the truth in your word. Thank you for your presence in your word. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you remind us that it, it was for freedom that you set us free. And Lord, we long to step into and embrace that freedom that you have for us. And Lord, we want to pray that you would give to us, you would help us to receive a fresh sense of your presence and power today. We say, come Holy Spirit, wherever we are, whether we're walking and listening, whether we're sitting at home on the settee or up in bed or whatever it is where we're engaging with this, whether we're in this country or overseas, we pray, come Holy Spirit, come and fill us up, come and give us a, a fresh sense of your presence and power. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we have in you. Thank you for the freedom that was purchased for us on the cross. Thank you for the power that you've displayed to us through the empty tomb and through your resurrection, Lord. And Lord, would you come and fill us with that presence? Would you come and fill us with your power? Lord, what would you show us with that? There's anywhere in the journey of life where we've fallen off uh, maybe into um, legalism and performance-based sort of spirituality or into licentiousness and somewhere or another where we've drifted from you and we've fallen into a trap that's been set for us. Lord, by your grace, would you reveal those things to us? And would you... So acknowledge those things in this moment. Would you draw us back into the fullness of relationship that you have for us in this moment? Thank you that you, in your kindness, you keep calling us back home, that you keep calling us into a total freedom in our relationship with you. Would you pour your spirit into our lives? Would you touch us afresh? Would you give us everything that we need for life and for love and for 
living, which he set us free from what other people might think of us and set us free to live before you, before you as the audience of one, to serve you and to glorify you and to celebrate you. And what as we go into this coming week, we pray your joy over us, we pray your peace over us, we pray your life over us, we pray your blessing over us. Lord, would you bless us? Would you watch over us? Would you make your face to shine upon us? Would you give us your presence? Would you give us your peace? And would you give us your blessing? Blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of us, both today and forevermore. Amen. So thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you uh, either in the building uh, for Pentecost Sunday or online uh, with, with a slightly uh, later than usual message. Questions for life groups and individual reflection follow uh, this message as well. But bless you and thank you so much for joining us.